Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Today will be a bit of a mix-up. Yeah, it's just like the other one that's on the channel. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. If you are new here and you begin to enjoy what you are hearing, please join us right here on Back to Ashes by hitting that subscribe button and setting your notification bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. If you're curious about becoming a member, that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in it warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Let's Not Encounter Backwoods Ghost Camping. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Went camping one summer with my parents, younger sister, and my friend. My friend and I were around 15 to 16 years old at the time. At the campground, my parents and sister stayed in a camper we owned, while my friend and I took a tent. We were all on the same lot, still. One night, it must have been close to midnight, my friend and I were sitting in the tent with our flashlights on. The campground was completely silent, and it seemed as if everyone else around us must be asleep. Out of nowhere, my friend and I hear this kid yelling for help. It kept getting louder and louder until we could hear him running as well. We were trying to turn off our flashlights when we saw the shadow of the person's feet running past our tent. We turned off the lights and sat in complete silence, terrified, as it sounded like another set of feet were running behind him as well. We waited for a while. When I peeked my head out of the tent, finally, we saw nothing. Heard nothing more, either. We couldn't believe no one else was peeking outside or looking around with us. We were terrified but ultimately made a run for it to the camper. We woke up my parents freaking out about what had happened and they all insisted they heard nothing, which made no sense to us because the screaming for help was so loud and right next to us. To this day, my friend and I feel crazy because we know what we heard and saw, and yet it seems no one else heard or saw this despite my family and so many other strangers being in such close proximity. This happened in, I want to say, 2007 or 2008, but it still freaks me out to this day. This all started when I was about 12. I'm 19 now. My sister, Zoe, father, stepmother at the time, and her two daughters, Jade, who's my age, and Maddie, my sister's age, were camping. We had only been there for a day and everything was fine. Then, me and my sisters decided we were going to go to the stream by ourselves. My father gave us the walkie-talkie so we could keep in contact while we were gone. Now the place we are going to was surrounded by bush, and to get there, you had to go down a little path through it. We spent a while with our shoes off and splashing in the water when Jade said she could see someone standing in amongst the trees. We all looked and saw a face. It was black, but you could tell it was the shape of a man. You couldn't see the face. We stared for a few seconds and then he disappeared. We forgot about it and kept playing in the water, but I felt a little uneasy. A while later, we all looked back, wanting to know if he was still there. And he was. Everything was silent. I could hardly hear the rapids in the little stream. We stopped looking. After about 20 minutes, we headed back to the campsite. My sisters lingered behind, and I was about 20 meters ahead of them. But we couldn't see each other. I heard a twig snap behind me, and I turned to look, assuming they had caught up to me. 
Nope. I turned to see the tall, dark black figure literally a foot behind me. So I started running. The whole time I could feel him close behind. I ran as fast as I could until I was in the open campground. He was gone. My sisters came out not long after and I told them what had happened. I asked but none of them had seen him behind me. They were too far behind and the path was windy so they were around a corner for most of the time. Throughout our camping trip we didn't see him around as much but occasionally would see him standing there. Fast forward a couple of years and we go back there with my father's new girlfriend and her daughter Stella. I can't recall this trip as much but I know for a fact that Stella saw him too. Three years ago, I started seeing him at my fucking house. Just anywhere and everywhere, really. One day, I was out in the backyard and I started to lean down to pat my cat, when in my peripheral vision, I saw him directly behind me. I ignored him, as he's never really done anything harmful, really. Look solely at my cat as to block him out. As I do, I feel a hand grab my hair and tug. I suddenly spun around. Nothing there. I fucked off inside as I was a bit spooked at that point. I now live with my boyfriend and can't say 100% if I've seen it again. I sometimes see shadows move behind me in the reflection of the TV, but when I look behind me, there's nothing so I just chalk it up to a trick of the light. I did hear something recently. This is the most recent event I've had. My boyfriend's alarm went off for work, waking me up too. He switched it off but lay in bed a bit longer. I was awake, then facing my boyfriend's back. One eye closed as it was smushed against the pillow. Suddenly, I shit you not... I hear someone whisper my name in my ear. It was so clear and I could even feel cold breath on me. I sat up and said to my boyfriend, Did you say my name? He looked confused. He was just sitting there playing on his phone. No, he said he didn't, which I believed, but it was a female's voice. This really doesn't relate to my other experience, but I thought I'd throw it in anyway. I have a rather big forest close to my home. Nothing special about it, neither creepy or mystical, and not pretty as well. Just a forest with trees, bushes, and so on. I used to go there a lot with my dog since it was so conveniently closed, and he could run around on his own while I was minding my own business. Around two or three years ago, I went there rather late. I think it was probably 9 p.m. When it started to get dark soon, but I still wanted to go for a short walk. I always stay on track so I don't disturb any wildlife or damage the plants. As it's getting darker and darker, I'm somewhat in the middle of the woods, but I felt all good since I know every small track there and I always would find my way back home. As I'm walking, I hear some weird noises rather close to my left. I couldn't make out what it was, but it sounded like a mixture of hissing and spoken words, but definitely nothing I've ever heard before. It didn't sound like anything earthly as stupid as that might sound. Then, my dog comes bursting out of the bushes, his tail clamped between his legs, totally focused on me and desperate to get going. He knew there was something weird going on. As I tried to calm him, I take a look into the woods, and there, maybe 20 meters away from me, I see a pair of deep red eyes staring directly at me. No movement, no blinking, or anything, for that matter. They just stare right at me. I'm struck and somehow can't really move, but I keep staring into those eyes. They were seriously red. 
I don't know really how to describe it, but again, nothing I had ever seen before. I knew that something was there, but didn't belong there. But I don't know what it was. It was like I was dreaming, a very eerie feeling, and the air was dry and crisp as hell, and I felt really calm for some reason, and just told my dog to follow me, and went away slowly. I never went back, but I know for sure that if I had looked there, the eyes would still have stared at me. After a couple of meters, I suddenly wake up from my trance and I just hit it. I'm full speed running with my dog through the forest, scared out of my mind, and I'm crying big time while I'm running. I don't even know why and what really happened, but everything just felt so freaking wrong and I just wanted to get away and as far away as possible from this place. To this day, I don't know what I saw there that night, and I don't think I really want to find out, to be honest. The only animals that are in that forest are deer and bears, but the eyes were at human face height, so somewhat between 1.5 meters and 2 meters height. Never stepped foot into the forest again, but I haven't heard from anything weird going on there as well. Just to make sure I didn't do any drugs or comparable things before going there. I'm still pretty sure weird shit would have happened to me if I had stayed. This entire scenario happened a few years ago when I used to take walks alone, occasionally at night, which is something I thought very little of since I lived in a heavily residential wealthy area. In other words, on the trail I'd frequent, houses were always within sight. On one such night, shortly into my walk, I see a figure walking a few hundred feet behind me. Something I knew immediately was odd, considering it was around ten at night. At first, I discounted this, though, since it was a public trail and they could have very well been open to do the exact same thing as me just going for a walk. I continued on for roughly five to ten minutes or so before looking behind me once more, only to find the same person still trailing me. Keep in mind at this point, I had gone through a few turns by now on the trail, meaning it was becoming more and more unlikely that this person just so happened to be going to the same direction. I decided to take paths and directions, turning off into gravel and weirder, more roundabout side areas, and they still followed me. By the time I was reaching the apex of my journey, passing by the local park, they were maybe less than 60 feet behind me, a distance that could easily have covered in seconds. It's then that I decided to call my family. I had researched for this. I knew what to do, and believe it or not, the call did not go through. As it turns out, my phone was a recent gift, and its service had been set up improperly, meaning that no matter how many times I frantically called, in that moment, nothing would happen. In a decision I call back to as one of my best to this day. I acted as if the call had gone through and was on the phone with my mom, miming out and talking audibly about my location, and the person behind me beginning to briefly describe them. Even in the act, I was unable to really do so, as I could never get a proper view of their face, as if it was somehow shrouded in something, but I did my best with what I had. Sure enough, when I turned around again, they were nowhere to be seen. Not that, that they had turned off and walked another direction, but that they weren't there to begin with. Weeks later, my mom told me that a police officer had come into her work and warned me about abductions that had been happening in our area, especially for child trafficking and organ trade. I count myself as very lucky, and whatever I leave the house now, I am very aware, only doing so during the day while taking a large knife with me.
There was a point later on in that neighborhood that a car clearly followed me, turning around into a cul-de-sac where there was no logical reason for them to be except for me. But this was the most obvious example of being kidnapped. Trigger warning. This story contains blood, sexual assault encounter, and stalking. This is also my first time telling people this story online, since everyone else in my family and close circle of friends know about this, so just be mindful that I'm doing my best explaining my story. I'm going to keep the intro short, but all you need to know is that I'm a 21-year-old female, but suffer from schizophrenia and disassociative identity disorder, or split personality disorder, as people call it, and have an alternate personality named Lucy, and that she is my defense mechanism and isn't afraid to throw the first punch. And for my safety, as well as Lucy's, we always carry a switchblade with us just in case. I have a friend whom I'm going to keep anonymous, though she is not really important to my story, but I'm glad she was with me to watch my back. This takes place roughly two to three years ago. I've surpassed the memory due to how traumatic it's been for me to reflect back on what could have happened to me before I got tube ligation. This takes place roughly during the early period of lockdown when masks were still required in public spaces before everything changed to online Zoom meetings. So I had just finished the school day at my high school. I was held back when I was young, which is why I'm a bit older than the normal high school age. And my friend and I walking back to my dad's apartment. Now it's my brother's apartment which is in a slightly sketchy area of my city and usually before we head back to my brother's place and there's a McDonald's close to my high school. So my friend and I sometimes occasionally go over to get a milkshake or Oreo McFlurry. And while my friend and I were waiting for our orders, I noticed a person in one of the booths occasionally staring at me, but I didn't think much of it since people occasionally stare at other people since it's natural to do so. As my friend and I left McDonald's with our order, we walked back to my brother's apartment as I'm talking with my friend as she is checking up on my altar, since most of the school teachers and faculty know about my mental health issues and how to deal with them. Anyways, as my friend and I were walking down a road or dirt path, cars go back and forth on... I can't help but always instinctively look behind me when I walk down this path, and for good reasons, since there has been shady stuff occurring in this area, since it's near a dead end in the corner. As I look behind me, I see a person walking behind us roughly 30 or 20 feet behind us, and I just passed it off as nothing since many people walk down this path to get to point A to point B instead of having to walk around this alleyway which has houses on the other side. As I'm walking with my friend, I can't help but keep on looking behind us as the person is still following us with a Mustang trailing behind this person as I begin walking faster with my friend. But in a moment of paranoia, my friend and I turn the corner and accidentally stop in front of the dead end. But... At this point, my friend and I are pinched between the dead end and the car that was following us and the person we saw earlier. My phone was in my backpack connected to my Chromebook charging, so I couldn't call for help, and my friend's phone was close to dying since she spends a lot of time on it and never bothers to charge it during school time, which is why she walks with me, knowing that my phone is pretty much plugged in, charging all day, every day. I can't stand the fact getting below 10%. So I'm currently stuck in the dead end with my friend as the person begins to approach us as he pushes my friend aside and takes out a gun and grabs me, as he then calls for his friends to hold me down as he tries to rip off my shirt and pants as I'm doing my best to escape. In the moment of panic and fear, as I'm semi-exposed, struggling for my life, 
I fear that I'm about to get r But before anything could happen, I remember shutting down for a moment, then waking up, as the next thing I see is that I've driven my switchblade into the stomach of my attacker as the others swiftly let go of me, allowing me to get up as I swiftly run to my friend with what little clothes I have on, and we quickly run to my brother's apartment, both completely petrified as my brother is in shock at my current state and is asking questions left and right. Meanwhile, I'm still hyperventilating and on the verge of crying. For the next few days, I couldn't bear stepping outside of the apartment due to how scared I still felt. I've gone through extensive therapy and have suppressed this memory as much as I could, and as far as people that tried to assault me, I haven't seen them since. While writing about this, I can't help but cry and remember each second of what could have happened to me. But if it hadn't been for Lucy, my altar, I would have suffered a terrible fate and wouldn't be here because of probable suicide. I've long moved past this terrible event in my life and have learned to live with it. This is something that happened to me when I was a kid, and I just wanted to share the story since it stuck with me for so long. I was about seven or eight years old. I really can't remember exactly, but it was around that age. One weekend, I was visiting my grandparents, who at the time lived on the countryside. I'm from Bosnia, Europe. They were only about an hour's drive away, and we went there early in the morning. Their house is in a wooded area with a long winding road leading up to each individual house of which they weren't many. Perhaps maybe three or four more. I knew the area well since I went to visit almost every weekend. Besides, going up to the houses there is one section of the road that leads directly into the woods. Sort of a nature trail, if you will. Our car broke down exactly around that spot flat tire. Since we were very close to where my grandparents live and my folks knew I was familiar with the area, they let me go for a walk while my dad fixed the tire. This was about 9 to 10 a.m. in the morning, so they weren't really afraid to let me run around a bit. Behind the curious kid that I was, and I still am, I went for the forest trail since the main dirt road wasn't very exciting. The trees were very tall and dense, so even during daytime, it was kind of dark. I went up the forest trail for a few hundred meters until I came to a crossroads. Now, this was more than 20 years ago, but it left a lasting impression on me. So, here is what I recall. In the middle of the crossroads, at the very point that the road forks, there was a small cave and opening of some sort. I went a bit closer and I noticed what seemed like fireflies sparkling in the pitch black hole. Not sure if it's fireflies even light up during the day, but that's how I remember it. Besides that, I just felt this presence. As if I wasn't alone there, as if the cavern was beckoning me to enter it. And then... I noticed what seemed like several pairs of similar red eyes peering from the darkness. At this point, I was quite spooked, thinking it was an animal of some sort, and I decided not to go any further and just slowly back away. This is in the Southeast Europe, so there aren't many dangerous animals around. Very rarely a wolf or a bear would be sighted, but usually not near human settlement. Nothing followed me, and I had no trouble getting back. I decided not to tell my parents about this, since I figured they would be mad and wouldn't let me play unsupervised for the remainder of our trip. They decided to leave me with my grandparents and pick me up on Monday, while they went back during the afternoon. I'm very close with my grandmother. She and I are very alike, especially now as a grown-up. So I told her about the encounter I had. 
She kind of laughed it off, saying, <laughs> Honey, there's nothing there. I walk there every day. But I was adamant about what I saw, and she agreed we'd go for a walk later and visit that spot. It wasn't far from her house, and we arrived there that same afternoon. We got to the crossroads, and, like she said, there was nothing there. No burrow or cave. Just a flat spot where the crossroads meet. No traces of it being dug up or buried. Grandma even asked me, are you sure it was here? And I replied, yes. She didn't think much of it, chalking it off to childish imagination. But she told me not to venture out here on my own again. We continued our walk, and I just stopped mentioning the event from then on. But to this day, even after all these years, I still remember this quite vividly. I even find it strange I'm able to recall the details. And of course, I know the memories can become distorted over time, and that what we think we remember may not always be the full picture, since our minds love to fill in the blanks, but I just don't feel as if this is the case. I often contemplate what would have happened had I stepped closer, or worse, tried to enter the cave. I've read about evil places in forests around the world, or places where time and space can become warped. People walking into what they described as different timelines or alternate dimensions. Perhaps this was one of those places in time. My grandparents don't live there anymore. Grandpa had passed away when I was 16 years of age, and my grandma moved to the city in the same building as me and my folks. We still own the house and there, but I haven't been there since. My dad goes out there a few times a year just to check up on things and clean up a bit. According to him, the house and land have almost been consumed by vegetation. They cut the electricity and water so they wouldn't pay the bills. So it's not very convenient staying over. But I do plan on going there sometime. Perhaps during my next time off. Sort of a vacation from work. I really want to go back to that road. Assuming it still exists. And just see if I feel anything. Now that I am an adult with an interest in the paranormal, I'm just so drawn to this memory. Has anyone else experienced something similar? Would love to hear your same thoughts. A few years ago, my friend Tez and I set out on the great American road trip. We were going to drive from New York to Los Angeles, zigzagging through the country for six weeks. We were both in our early 20s, nearly broke, and as my mom had been a long-haul trucker, I suggested that we save a ton of money. We should sleep in the back of our hatchback. It was a pretty cozy setup. We bought some blankets and sheets at Goodwill and cut one of them up to make curtains. By the end of the first week, we'd gotten so we could set up camp in about 10 minutes. Luggage moved to the front, curtains up, bedding laid down and out for the night. We slept in parking lots, free campsites, rest areas, basically anywhere it seemed safe and semi-legal. There was never a night, after the first night, where we felt scared until we reached the last week of the trip in Arizona. We were near Flagstaff and had gotten pretty used to our routine. We didn't go on a set schedule and would never drive more than three to four hours a day. No destination really in mind, only a few must-see landmarks. We'd drive to places we found the night before on Google and take suggestions from other campers, locals, and people we had met. We had also gotten very good at making friends. We went to Denny's with a group of rednecks we had met at a campsite in the back of their pickup because I got hungry and overheard them saying they were going to go. We met an 80-year-old cowboy who took us out drinking and taught us to line dance at a country bar. 
Hope you're still kicking, Grandpa Mac. Played the guitar with some musicians in the middle of a thunderstorm. Got fed breakfast and dinner by tons of campers who invited us to hang out with them. Spent the 4th of July with a family who basically adopted us into their campsite. Grandma gave us some weed candy. Basically, every encounter we had with a stranger was a positive one. This night didn't look to be any different. We found a free campsite on Google and drove up into the woods following our GPS. We were pretty far out of town and something seemed a little bit off when we pulled up to the campsite. There was one RV parked and two cars further up in the trees. We pulled up near the RV. A man opened the door. Tez waved hello and he just stared at her. His expression was completely blank. Then, as if she hadn't said anything, he just slowly closed the door again, staring at us the entire time. Figuring he just wanted some privacy and thought we were being obnoxious, we pulled further down the road and found a flat spot to park the car. Instead of our usual routine of setting up camp immediately while it was light out, we goofed around for a while, smoking and laughing and taking dumb photos of ourselves. Tez pointed at a campfire further down a campsite and we decided to be friendly. We'd met so many cool people in the previous five weeks by just going up and offering beer or just chatting. So we wandered over. Near the campfire, there were two men, the owners of the cars we'd seen earlier. They seemed friendly and we sat down to chat with them. They were drinking and smoking and we sat down and had a beer with them. One of the men seemed pretty off and we came to find out that the two of them didn't actually know each other. The elder man was definitely on some sort of drugs. He was spinning in circles and talking about UFOs. However, he seemed harmless. This left us chatting with the younger man who claimed to be a former park ranger. He was handsome and easygoing, and we spent several hours just chatting about our trip, families, and everything else. Then he started talking about the bear. He'd seen a bear earlier in the forest. Tez didn't believe him, and he pulled out his camera to show her photos of the bear. It was very close to the campsite, and we both were a little freaked out. It wasn't unheard of for one of us to get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, so the idea of a bear hanging around in the night spooked us. The ranger just laughed, and then his expression completely changed. It's hard to describe, but his voice seemed somehow cold. He said, If you get out of your car in the middle of the night, it's not a bear you should be worried about. I keep waiting for the laugh or for him to nudge Tez in his elbow. Jokes on the foreigner and the city girl, right? He never did. I laughed awkwardly and made a dumb joke about serial killers in the woods. My friend laughed as well and joked about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We moved on to another subject, but within five minutes, the ranger had come back to it and was talking about something grabbing us from our car in the middle of the night. No matter how we tried to steer the conversation away from serial killers, he kept latching back on. The old man was high as a kite at this point and was staring at the stars, not talking. We just awkwardly laugh and sip our beer and try to get the conversation going somewhere else. Then the ranger stood up and walked closer to the cooler to get another beer. At this point, it's pitch black out, and I can't see anything outside the circle of light from the campfire. Beer cooler was outside of the circle. Suddenly, there is a red dot in the darkness, and it took a moment for me to realize that it's a camera. The ranger is holding a camera. He had taken a photo of us. I could see the screen on the digital camera light up. Now... It wasn't odd for the people we met to ask to take pictures with us. My friend Tez is gorgeous, dark hair, blue eyes, like a young Megan Fox. And we were friendly. People like having pictures of themselves. It was an entirely strange thing to have this person taking a picture of us without asking. 
or even indicating that that's what he was doing. We were both staring at him like deer in the headlights at this point, but instead of realizing what he's doing is a bit weird, he checks his camera, adjusts some things, and takes another photo, this time with the flash. No asking us to smile, no proposing a group photo, and no explanation. After this photo, he comes back to the fire and sits down. Not a word said about the photo. At this point, me and Tez are actually freaked out. We make some bullshit excuse that we need to go to set up our campsite and nope the hell out. When we stand to leave, the UFO guy smiles and says to have a good night. Ranger, however, looks at us with a smile that doesn't reach his eyes and says, be careful out there, there's more than bears in the woods. Every hair on my body stood on end. I wasn't alone in my discomfort either, because Tez laughed a response out and pulled me away from the campfire towards our car. We rushed back to the car, which we only found in the dark, by referencing the RV and jump in the front seats. My friend Tez is all but hyperventilating. Why did he take that picture of us? I was shaking. I responded. I read that serial killers sometimes warn their victims. She stared at me for a second and locked the car doors. Do you think he just took victim photos of us? We both freaked out. She's in a full-blown panic and turns the headlights on in the car. I immediately yell at her to turn them off because now he knows exactly where our car is. God only knows, but that is the only night we not set up camp. We didn't need to tear anything down, so we just put the car in drive and floored it out of that campsite. As we got onto the dirt road, Ranger was walking towards our car with the same cool expression. So, to the park ranger, let's not ever meet again. My three-year-old son suffered from chronic ear infections last year, which led to him having high fevers. I slept with him on this particular night because I needed to give him Tylenol throughout the night to keep his fever down and keep him comfortable. I set my alarm to wake me up at around 2.30 a.m. When I woke up, I went into the kitchen to get the Tylenol. I noticed a bright light shining into the apartment from our deck door, which also illuminated part of the woods behind the apartment. When I went over to see what it was, it turned out to be a car with those bright LED headlights in the parking lot to the far back right of the apartment. I figured they were dropping something off. I saw the movement of what resembled a dog walking around near the woods. I started to think that the lady who usually walks her dog, a cute little corgi, in that area supposedly faced her car in that direction so she could see while she was walking her dog. As they got closer, I realized that there was nobody out there walking a dog, and there was no dog. I don't know what it was that I saw, but I'll describe it in the best way that I can. At first, it looked like a dog, corgi size, but as it walked closer, it looked like your average house cat. Then, it looked like a black bear, and then it looked like a koala. I live in North New Jersey farmland and lots of woods, and there are no wild koalas here. At this point, my heart is pounding out of my chest and I am scared. The fear I felt was like a primal type of fear I have never felt before. I ran to my bedroom to wake up my boyfriend and I shook him awake very roughly, and I said, you gotta come see this. He was a bit annoyed at me, understandably. When we look outside together, we see this thing getting closer and it looks like a skunk now, white striped down the center with this perky fluffy tail. I said, <laughs> oh, it's just a skunk, <laughs> with a little chuckle. I felt a bit embarrassed that I woke him up over a damn skunk, but at that moment I also felt relieved. However, I was mistaken. 
As it walked, it looked as if it was struggling to find a form. I thought it looked like it was falling apart, but also coming back together again at the same time. I know this doesn't make any sense, but it's hard to find the words for what we saw. After the skunk formation, it looked like a person crawling on the ground with some type of fur or skin attached to them around the leg. Then it changed again and looked like a raccoon, groundhog, black bear, cat, koala, deer, and skunk. The part that stuck out to me the most was that whatever it was seemed to be coming apart or shedding, but at the same time it was growing. Whoever had their headlights on turned them off as it went deeper into the woods. This happened pretty quick. I'd say it was only about a couple of minutes from start to finish. My boyfriend ended up going back to bed, but I couldn't sleep after that, so I grabbed a flashlight and shined it into the woods to see if I could see it again. But it was gone. I also opened the door to see if I could hear anything, but I couldn't. It was very quiet. I had a very hard time going back to sleep that night. My boyfriend wasn't scared, but he was confused and stunned. He didn't know what to make of it. I was scared and creeped out. I know if I hadn't have woken him up to see it for himself, he most likely wouldn't believe me and would have chalked it up to me being groggy from just waking up or it just being an animal. Unfortunately, I know what I saw and I will never ever forget it. I rented a house in El Paso, Texas. Just a heads up, this is a very long post, but it's worth the wait. Anyway, back in 2011, I was living in a house in El Paso, Texas for a year with my two sons. It was a nice place with a huge backyard for your dogs and three bedrooms, two dens, and a two-guard garage. Great place for the price I was renting it. Also, the landlord lived almost across the street from me, so he was always close by if I needed anything. Shortly after moving in, a matter of weeks, I was in my bedroom watching TV and unwinding from a long day. I was unemployed at the time and had received a severance check from my ex-employer and was living off that while I was job searching. My bedroom was right across the hall from my youngest son's bathroom, and my oldest son had his bathroom next door to mine, as he was disabled, and there were times I would have to get up in the middle of the night if he needed to use the bathroom. Late that night, I heard singing coming through the AC vents, and assumed it was my son's girlfriend, whom had just moved in with us and had a great singing voice. I chalked it up to that and told myself that I would speak to my son about it in the morning. The following morning, I asked my son about it with his girlfriend there, and he told me that he thought the singing was coming from my room. They thought maybe I was watching something on TV and just turned up theirs to block out the song. So yeah, that was weird. This house was an older house, built in 1959 and built in an L shape on one side of the L, having bedrooms and bathrooms, and on the other side had the den, dining room, kitchen, another room that could be used as an office or spare bedroom, and ended with the garage. All doors and windows had wrought iron. It started that when we would leave the house, we would lock the wrought iron door going into the house from the garage, and many times upon our return, the door would be unlocked. The same happened when we were in the house. The door would remain unlocked while we were all inside the house. But many times, when I would have to go to the garage, the door would be locked. Also, this house had been renovated. It had new tile, carpet, cabinets in the kitchen and such. But certain rooms had these old-style push-button light switches. They would be lit if the lights in the room were off, and then you would push it and the switch would make a loud, audible double-click. Sounded like a ka-chuck. And the lights would turn on. 
In the hallway, the guest bathroom's light started turning on at different times of the night, but only when we were awake. We would be watching TV in the den, and we would hear the click, and the light in the bathroom would be on. No one was around when it did this, and we could find no reason for it to be doing this either. I remember shortly after we had moved in, I had a brother over to help me connect all of my devices to connect a Wi-Fi modem. After he got done getting everything set up, it was dark outside, and he asked where the bathroom was. I told him, first door on the left, down the hallway. I heard him go in, press the light switch, could chuck. And as I heard him relieving himself, the house was not that big of a house, I heard a loud kachuk again, and then my brother screamed out, What the fuck? He flushed and came out. We told him we had all heard it and told him that this was happening on a kind of regular basis. As we were still settling in at this house, I bought a touch-sensitive lamp that I could place on the table next to my son's hospital bed, so that those times that he called me late at night, I could just go in and tap the light and have light in his room. From off, if you touched the light once, it would light dimly or low. The second touch would be brighter or medium, and a third touch would put the light at its brightest setting. And, of course, the fourth touch would turn it off again. Well, after about a week that this light was there, it started to turn on in the middle of the night. But it always seemed to turn on between midnight and 2 a.m. And it was always on the second, or medium, setting. Never the low or the high setting. There was no way that my disabled son would have been able to reach the light as it was to the left of his bed and out of range of his hands and arms. He has had limited range of motion in his arms after his car accident. This light turned on every night without fail. There were several times that I tried to stay awake just so that I could catch the light turning on and run into the room to catch our invisible culprit. It never worked. I could be sitting up in bed with my door wide open watching for the hallway to brighten from the light being turned on. I was never able to catch it. As soon as I would start to doze off and my eyes would close, I would snap awake and the light would already be on. At this time, I downloaded a Ghost Hunters app on my iPhone to test some things out. That night, I was walking around the house testing to get EMF readings. They were the highest in my son's room. My brother was over again that night and told me it was probably picking up the electrical current from the wiring in the walls. So, he decided to kill all the power to the house at the main fuse box and to check the room again. Even with the power turned off, the EMF readings were high in the guest bedroom and highest again in my disabled son's room. One night, I had my girlfriend staying over, and that night, after we had had our fun, we opened the door to my room so if my son called, I could hear him. We went to sleep. I woke up to hear screaming, yelling that someone was at the door. I looked, and sure enough, there was a shadow figure at the door. I'm getting goosebumps just writing this right now. I jumped out of my bed as I saw it move to the left of the door and ran into the hallway. From there, I saw the shape go into the bathroom, the same one that had the light being turned on by itself. I turned on the light, my hands shaking, and the room was empty. I could not get my girlfriend to go back to sleep, and she packed up all of her stuff and left. The next day, I decided to go across the street to speak with my landlord and tell him the things that were happening. It was then that he told me that he had bought the house after the woman that had lived there had passed on. She died in the house. And he bought it and turned it into a rental property. And I was his first tenant at that house. After I told him all of the things that we were experiencing, he told me that he was willing to rent a video camera that we could set up in my son's room. I told him, mm, maybe. 
that we would just see how things progressed, as no one had been harmed and whatever was in that house did not seem malevolent in any way. As weeks turned into months, and each night passing meant me waking up in the middle of the night to turn off the light in my son's room, as it would wake me up eventually. The doors around my house would lock and unlock themselves. The light in the bathroom would turn on and off, etc. We kind of got used to it. One night, I was asleep in my room. I had the AC on, and the ceiling fan on in my room, as El Paso summer nights can be hot as hell. Anyway, I was asleep and was awakened by the sound of the vertical blinds knocking against themselves. I wrote it off as the air being blown around by the fan and the AC. I closed my eyes and was just about to doze off again when I felt the hair on the back of my neck prick up. I closed my eyes tighter and told myself, Don't look. Don't look. As soon as I thought that, I felt breathing on my right ear, and as plain as day, something whispered, Mother, into my ear. I yelled and jumped out of bed and turned on my light. And nothing. There was no one there. As time moved on, I started dating another woman with three kids, and when things started to get serious between her and I, I converted the room that could be used as an office into a spare room with a set of bunk beds and another small bed for this girlfriend's youngest daughter. As they would come over and started spending weekends with us, they shared experiencing things too, mostly the shadow figure. The little girl was the one that would see this the most, get scared and come into our room and jump into bed with us. All of us had experiences with the shadow, as we started to call it. There were times I would be watching TV in the den, and I would feel the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I would spin around only to catch a dark streak moving away, and in a second it was gone. Anyway, as our one-year lease was coming close to an end, I contacted the El Paso Paranormal Society and asked if they could come out and check out the house. I called them, sent an email via their website, and never got an answer. My girlfriend and I got married. This did not last, but that's another story. And we ended up buying a house in the same neighborhood, only about three blocks from this one. As we were almost done with our move, I was finally contacted by the El Paso Paranormal Society. Needless to say, they were anxious to come check out the house and wanted to set up an appointment about two weeks from the day of our call. I told them we were already moving to a new place and that we would not be living there any longer by the time they were able to come out. So, the guy I spoke to told me, make sure that the last thing that I should do when I leave the house for the final time would be to announce to whatever was in the house that it needed to stay there and that it was not allowed to follow me. His telling me this gave me chills, but I said, sure, okay. That night, as me and my girlfriend are getting the last things out of the house, we did a final walkthrough, making sure all of the lights were off, the doors locked, etc. The landlord had already been over to inspect and just ask us to leave the light on in the house. We chose to leave the light on in the kitchen, as it had a window with vertical blinds that looked out into the driveway of the house. This way, it would be seen... This way, it would seem as if somebody was home. As my wife and I got into each of our own cars and had our windows down and were speaking with each other, I remembered what the ghost hunter guide had told me. I yelled over to my wife to hold on a sec. I got out of my car, unlocked and opened the front door and stood in the doorway and said, Whatever is in this house, this is now your house. You are not allowed to follow us. You must stay here. I backed out of the house, closed and locked the door, and got back into my car. I yelled over to my wife, Let's go. When all of a sudden, right in front of both of us, 
we saw one of the vertical blinds in the kitchen window move sideways as if somebody was looking out. Getting chills again just writing that part. We looked at each other and said, let's get the fuck out of here now. And we left. I almost left out one of the creepiest things. There was one morning that I woke very early, like 4.30ish, and that damn light was on in my son's room yet again. I always tried to catch the light and turn it off before it woke my son, as due to his brain injury, sleep was very important for him to have. As I walked in quietly to turn off the light, I was pissed that this had been going on so long and nightly. I tapped the light twice to turn it off and started to walk out of the room. I stopped at the foot of my son's hospital bed and said out loud, If there is something here, turn on that fucking light. And almost immediately, the light turned on. I did not realize that my son, who I thought was asleep at the time, woke up. The look of terror on his face shook me to my core. To this day, I still have nightmares about that morning and the look on his face. After that morning, I unplugged that lamp and put it away in the garage. Still, like I said, there were no other things that occurred here. But this story would be easily ten times what I wrote about earlier to even begin to touch on most of what we went through. Oh, by the way, for the non-believers, the house is real. It is located at 2921 First Street in El Paso, Texas. You can Google it and see it looks like a normal house. You can even see the kitchen window that is close to the driveway that had that single vertical blind pushed sideways that last night there. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, creepy, let's not encounter backwoods ghost camping. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Thank you all so much for remaining the pillars of which BTA stands. I can't say it enough. I appreciate every last one of you from the bottom of my heart. To the other subscribers and the new listeners, thank you so much for the support that you are showing Back to Ashes. It makes my heart smile knowing that I can read you all stories and you're getting the relaxation and the vocal melatonin to fall asleep that you need. If you're asleep, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all. <laughs>